Our great God is always at work, but some days it's just a little easier for us to see than others. And today for me, from the Lord's Supper talk about proclaiming the return of Jesus to the prayers that were offered and the connections made in the songs to the things that you and I will now study together in Luke chapter 21. The Lord is most absolutely at work in the hearts of every person in the room. And I'm prayerful as we begin that your hearts are open to what God is doing. He works through us and in us. And may he do so as we continue in Bible study today in Luke chapter 21, the context, one of the contexts where Jesus talks about the destruction of Jerusalem. And so we'll get into that in just a moment. I would say that this study, what we're about to do here in this text, and this will be our main text, so be sure that you are there, shares similarities and connections to both of the lessons from last Sunday. Now, I know you've forgotten them. I forget them too. Sometimes I'll be doing the email on Monday and have to look back at what I preached yesterday. So I will reestablish those connections. First of all, one of our lessons last week was similar to this and that we were in the Gospel of Luke and we just went through Luke 16. It was a challenging chapter about the, the unrighteous steward who was praised by his master and how we need to be like that. There was context about the Pharisees who were lovers of money and some of the context in the middle. And then the story we know at the end about the rich man and Lazarus. So we just used Sunday night and walked through it. And in that way, we're going to do the exact same thing. And there is some monetary connections, some similarities in the opening verses. But also, since this text is about the 70 A.D. awful destruction of Jerusalem, the decimation of the people of Israel, of their temple, of their records, of their city. It reminded me of last week's study in Isaiah. Do you guys remember Hezekiah? Hezekiah's in the city and the people are in the city of Jerusalem and Sennacherib and his Rabshakeh are attacking and destroying everyone everywhere. And in that story, 700 years before Jesus, in that story, God said, stay in the city because I'm going to protect the city. I will drive the enemy away and Jerusalem will stand. I will preserve my nation. This story is the exact opposite of that. In this story, he says, get out of the city. I'm sending someone to actually destroy the city of Jerusalem and you don't want to be anywhere near it when it happens. Now, I found that very fascinating, but I'm sharing it with you because to me, it absolutely crystallizes this concept of moving away from a natural, physical kingdom to a spiritual one. Back in 700 AD, God was still preserving a, nat a, a nationality of people called the Jews. They were his special, physical, literal people. But now we're going to find out that that time is coming to an end. They will no longer be a kingdom related to your bloodline, related to how close you live to Jerusalem. All of it will be gone forever. And my people will not be the Jews. They will be the disciples and the Christians. So that transition is completed in 70 AD in the destruction of Jerusalem. So we're going to talk about some of that today and see, yes, along the way, see if we can make some connections to what is happening now in your life and what is most absolutely coming. Let's begin with some reading. I need you in Luke chapter 21, and I'll begin in the first six verses. Jesus. Jesus looked up, verse 1. And he saw the rich putting their gifts into the treasury. And he saw a poor widow putting in two small copper coins. And he said, truly, I say to you, this poor widow put in more than all of them, for they all out of their surplus put into the offering. But she out of her poverty put in all that she had to live on. And while some were talking about the temple, that it was adorned with beautiful stones and votive gifts, he said, as for these things which you're looking at, the days will come in which there will not be one stone left upon the other. All of it will be torn down. Now he's going to go into this destruction of Jerusalem description. But do you kind of get the feel of what's happening here? There are these believers who are wealthy, as wealthy as they could be under Roman jurisdiction, but they really carved out a niche of comfort for themselves. And they had lots of money in their pockets, and so they would give a little bit, but not sacrificially, not all that they had. And in fact, they were kind of proud of it. Like, look at our lives. We have these great lives, and I've got 
full pockets. I mean, and I give on Sundays. Look at our beautiful temple. Isn't life great? And Jesus is like, everybody listen up and look at me. You see that sweet little widow over there who just gave her last two pennies? Do you see her? The kingdom is for people who do not buy into all of this who do not value the greatness of their life by how much they have in their pockets or how beautifully all of the material things are. I'm looking for people who are surrendering all to me, not taking pride in what they get to keep. And he said, you better get this because a day is coming. And I'm going to be, tr I'm trying to save it to the end, but I cannot help myself. The trickling in effect is already beginning. In 2 Peter 3, we are told of a day when every physical thing we have will be destroyed with intense heat. When the earth and all of its works and this beautiful building we're in and this night suit I'm wearing and all of the money that's still in my wallet after that tray will be gone. And we're so like, look at how much God blessed us and how much he loves us and how much God has done for us. And Jesus is going, this is all going to go away. This is all going to go away. I'm looking for people like her. People who are all into me and would give all to me because he's telling them, let's flash back to them. He's saying there is a day coming, verse six, when all of it will be gone. Can I take just a minute or two? And by the way, interesting art here. I know it's a little dim in the picture, but this is some old art that was painted to depict the beginning of the destruction of the city of Jerusalem. Are you familiar with what happened to their beautiful temple and all of their great wealth that they have? In 70 A.D., 40 years after Jesus did this, 40 years into the days of the church, there was a Roman siege led by a military leader named Titus. It occurred three days before the Passover. What does that mean? It means Jews were packed in like sardines, like the whole city from wall to wall was filled with Jews. It's kind of like Pentecost, Acts 2, except not. You know what I mean? In Acts 2, they were packed in and they learned about the church and they all became Christians. Now they're all packed in, but something else is going to happen. Three days before the Passover, with millions of Jews assembled, he attacked and the attack lasted five months, an unrelenting attack. And during that time, the walls that Nehemiah built were torn down and the temple that was reconstructed was torn down and all of what they had was destroyed. Josephus was a historian that dated back near to that period of time and he testified in his materials that over one million Jews were put to death. 1.1 million Jews, all of the armed Jews instantly put to death, all of the elderly instantly put to death. Everyone under 17, the children were all sold into slavery and a hundred thousand of them. We're not talking about persecution for being a Christian yet. When I say this, we're just talking about being clueless Jews who thought that they had everything they ever needed and they could boast in the life that they had built from themselves. A hundred thousand of them died in the Colosseums at the mouths of lions and at the sport of the Roman oppressor. It is no wonder that our merciful, loving Jesus lamented ongoingly in his ministry this particular event. They had it coming as judgment because they refused to understand the nature of the kingdom, but Jesus loved them anyway. Let me show that to you really briefly. Go back to Luke 13. I'm just going to use Luke's record to help with this. During his ministry in Luke 13, Jesus spoke often about it. In Luke 13, in verse 34, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, verse 34, the city that kills the prophets and stones those sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together just as a hen gathers her brood under her wings and you would not have it. Behold, your house, your precious house is left to you desolate. And I say to you, you will not see me until the time comes when you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. He lamented their destruction. In fact, if you'll move forward to chapter 23, and I read this the other day in our daily reading, and I'd forgotten that it was there. But on the day that Jesus was crucified, while he was being walked to his own execution, he said some things, and I want you to notice him. Look in Luke chapter 23 in verse 27. He's being marched away to death. And following him, verse 27, was a large crowd of the people and of women who were mourning and lamenting him. They're lamenting his death. 
Jesus turned to them and said, daughters of Jerusalem, stop weeping for me. Weep for yourselves and weep for your children. For behold, the days are coming when they will say, blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, just fall on us, mountains and hills. Please just bury us. For if they do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it's dry? They're sad about his death. He's sad about theirs. He knows he's going to be raised again. He knows that he's establishing an eternal kingdom. They're going to perish in a city that they thought meant something. It meant nothing if they were not true disciples. And so back in our text, Jesus is talking to Jews who live in that city about what they needed to know as the time of destruction came near. One of the things we've already noted is all this physical stuff you think matters is not going to matter anymore. And I hope that has some some shadow effect for you. But here's something else he said. He said, you will begin to notice that circumstances will deteriorate. You will begin to notice wars. You've heard some of this language before and rumors of wars. You will begin to see that all this stuff that you think is so great and this alliance that you have with Rome, you're going to start to see that thing shaking. And you're not going to have the government support that you once had. And it's not going to sound as secure as it once did. And so let's read beginning in verse 7 down through verse 19. I want you to hear about the warning of the deterioration and also want you to see what they're told to do. Verse seven, which of you, Luke 17, seven, having a slave plowing or tending sheep will say to him when he has come in from the field, come immediately and sit down to eat. But will he not say to him, prepare something for me, Luke 17, to eat and properly clothe yourself. I'm in Luke 17. I'm getting there. I mean to be in 21. Sorry. I was like, man, I want to preach on that, but it's not where it's supposed to be. Luke 17 is also the destruction of Jerusalem. But in Luke 21, let's begin in verse 7. May I have to switch tonight's sermon. That was really getting going. Pick up in verse 7. Verses 7 through 19. They question him saying, Teacher, when therefore will all these things happen? And what will be the sign when these things are about to take place? And he said, See to it that you are not misled. For many will come in my name saying, I am and the time is near. Do not go after them. When you hear of wars and disturbances, do not be terrified, for these things must take place first, but the end does not immediately follow. Then he continued by saying to them, nation will rise against nation and kingdom, verse 10, against kingdom, and there will be great earthquakes and in various places, plagues and famines, and there will be terrors and great signs from heaven, verse 12. But before all these things, they will lay their hands on you. They will persecute you. They will deliver you to the synagogues, the Jews will, and to prisons, bringing you before kings and governors for my namesake. It will lead to an opportunity for your testimony. So make up your minds, verse 14, not to prepare beforehand to defend yourselves. For I will give you the utterance and wisdom which none of your opponents will be able to resist or refute. But you will be betrayed even by parents and brothers and relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. You will be hated by all because of my name, yet not a hair of your head will perish. By your endurance, you will gain your lives. He says, it's going to get bad. The alliances will falter and you will begin to be picked out and pointed to because of your faith. And even people you thought you could trust, you will not be able to trust because Christianity will become dangerous. And when it becomes dangerous, the fickle will flee. But here's what he said, verse 9. He said, as you start to see it all falling apart, first of all, verse nine, don't be terrified. Don't be surprised. Don't be overwhelmed by it because he said it will lead to an opportunity for your testimony. And I want you to think through this. Are your monetary gains being taken away? The very people you thought loved you are turning against you. Things are going from bad to worse. And instead of being scared and terrified and wondering what in the world is going on, you see it as an opportunity to testify. That's awesome. When you see things start deteriorating, start telling people, hey, you know why this is happening? Because this is all going away. You know why we can't trust the government? Because it's made up of knuckleheads. The only person we can trust is Jesus. I want to use our peril as an opportunity, verse 13, to tell you about Jesus. You say, well, what should I say? Look what he said. He said, don't even think about what to say. Certainly don't defend yourself. Well, let me tell you why you shouldn't be so mad at me. Let me tell you why you should, you should leave my stuff alone. He said, don't defend yourself. I will send my Holy Spirit and my Holy Spirit will tell you exactly what to say. 
He will put the utterances in your mouth. He will teach you how to share salvation in Jesus, not protection of all this stuff. And I, here I go again. As circumstances deteriorate in our world, do not be afraid. And as things become less stable, understand it is an opportunity for your testimony. What do you mean testimony, Chris? What am I supposed to say? What am I supposed to tell people? If only God would show me what to say. Speak the Spirit. Speak the Spirit to people. Speak salvation in Jesus. Assurances that go far beyond all of this that we thought was so great. The Spirit will put the words into your heart and mouth. It is a time for your testimony. And he said, be courageous. Because if you are willing to endure, if you are willing to endure when you must stand alone, when your own family has turned against you, and there are people in this room who know exactly what that feels like, when everything you thought would sustain you is falling out from under your material feet, he said, your endurance will allow for your souls to be gained in heaven. Verse 19, by your endurance, you will gain your lives. I have to admit, verse 18 is a challenge for me. Verse 18. And I know he's talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. So let's go back to that. When this great time comes, Jesus is going to tell them what to do. Don't panic. Keep preaching. And he's going to tell them in a moment, I'm about to show it to you what you need to do. And what he's saying is, if you do what I say, you will live. And they literally lived. Of the 1.1 million Jews who died, there is not a grand record of Christians being among them. You know what I mean? Because they had fleed. But he also said some of you will be put to death in the verse just before it. So what's the deal? You know what the deal is. If you're living for Jesus and you're courageous in Jesus and you're sharing the word of Jesus, you live even if you die. You know, those who survived the destruction of Jerusalem, did you know that they're all still alive today? Did you know that everybody who escaped Jerusalem was granted an eternal house in the Alps? No, they still died. They escaped an immediate judgment, but they still died, and yet they still live. And so to me, it's figurative in a way when he says, not a hair on your head will perish. It's a lot like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Maybe we perish, maybe we don't, but we don't perish because God is with us. What a wonderful attitude. And I wish that all Christians could have it. That we didn't panic like everybody else and hold on tight and try to retain things. And we truly 100% full surrender believed that live or die, we live because Jesus lives. Now, they were given some instruction and I want to show it to you. So go back with me to the text and I want to read verses 20 through 24. When you see, verse 20, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by enemies, then recognize that her desolation is near. Now, again, what you're about to read is the exact opposite of Isaiah. Totally different picture this time around. He said, then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. And those who are in the midst of the city must leave. And those who are in the country must not enter the city because these are days of vengeance so that all things which are written will be fulfilled. Woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days, for there will be great distress upon the land and wrath to this people. And they, verse 24, will fall by the edge of the sword and will be led captive into all the nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. So I'm going to put three things in the corner. Does this remind you of anything? Think Old Testament. When judgment is coming and the place that you thought would protect you can no longer protect you, and everything is crashing from every corner. Flee. Get away from them. Clear out. If you are away from those people of devastation, stay away from them. Do not... I'm going to help you. You need a little help or you don't need help? Do not look back. Do not stay. What does it remind you of? Lot. Remember the story of Lot, how he said, Sodom and Gomorrah, I am destroying that city that had provided Lot a lot of good. Lot got a lot, Lot, okay, there it is. There it is. Lot got a lot out of that. But eventually all that Lot got was going to be gone. Now you say, well, that's an odd little connection. It's not an odd connection. Remember when I started reading in Luke 17 out of nowhere a minute ago? Go back there. Go back to Luke 17 with me. And look in verse 26. Luke 17, you can research it on your own, is the same story. He talked quite a bit about this destruction. And we'll just pick up here in our text in about uh, verse 26. 
And just as it happened in the days of Noah, so it will be also in the days of the Son of Man. They were eating, they were drinking, they were marrying, they were being given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. It was the same as happened in the days of Lot. They were eating, they were drinking, they were buying and selling and planting and building. But on the day that Lot went out from Sodom, get out, go away. It rained fire and brim. Don't miss that. Like that's unmistakable right there. It rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. It will be just the same on the day that the Son of Man is revealed. Now pause for a moment. When he says Son of Man is revealed, he's talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. When Son of Man is revealed in 70 AD, that will happen to everybody who thinks they're godly, but they are not godly, and you need to be away from them when it happens. But can we follow this to its natural fruition? That an even greater day of the Lord is coming when all who believe themselves righteous will be revealed not to be if they are not. And so the advice that is here is needful for us all. On that day, verse 31, the one who is on the housetop and whose goods are in the house must not go down to even go get them. Don't even go pack up. And likewise, the one who is in the field must not turn back. Remember, there it is. Remember Lot's wife. Not just a punchline. You know, in churches, we've talked about putting it over the clock in the back so that when you turn back to see how long I've been preaching, it's not funny here, though. She was attached. I wonder how many Jewish Christians struggle with this. I mean, think it through with me. They built their life in Judea. They've got their homesteads. Maybe they live in the city. They have a lot of friends who are Jews who aren't Christians. They're not Christians, but, you know, they're good people. And there's all this stuff. And then all of a sudden, circumstances start to deteriorate. And Jesus said, as you see things destabilize, leave them. Get away from them. Flee as far away as you can. How many Christians just couldn't do it? I'm more wondering how many Christians can't do it. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, I'll just note this for you. 2 Corinthians has fellowship in it, one of our words from the class this morning. But he said, what fellowship have people of God with people of the world? And in 2 Corinthians 6, he said, come away from them and be separate. Now, I understand that you have to live among the people of the world, but I think it's easy to heed a warning. If Jesus is coming again and destruction is coming again and all of this will be destroyed and he will gather together all those who are of the world and live like the world, I don't want to be among them. You know what I mean? I don't want to be, I don't want to look just like them and act just like them and hang out with them and do what they want to do. And just in the end go, Jesus, by the way, not one of them. He's like, you're in the city and I'm going to destroy everyone in the city. No, no, but you missed it, Lord. You missed it. I'm not one of these people. If you are with them, you are them. Wow. Okay. So, if we're children of God and the world around us is deteriorating and judgment could be at any moment, there ought to be a tangible, real separation between our fellowship with the world, with whom we share very little, nothing that is eternal, and the fellowship that we have with the people of God. Their instructions were given and must be heeded. Because, go back to the text with me and let's read verses 25 through 28. Because he is coming. They will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power. Let's read this together. Luke chapter 7, or 21 again. I'll get back over there. Luke chapter 21. And let's begin here in verse 25. There will be signs in sun and moon and stars, and on the earth dismay among nations. In, I'm in Luke 21, 25, in perplexity at the roaring of the sea and the waves, men fainting from fear and the expectation of the things which are coming upon the world, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. But when these things begin to take place, straighten up and lift up your heads. Because your redemption is drawing near. I want you to just see it because I think it's wonderful. You guys know about me in the hands, okay? Jesus is coming back. The whole place is on fire. Everything that is physical is gone and everyone who lived for the physical is, what are they doing? They're screaming. They're running. They're hiding like Adam and Eve in the bushes, hoping that God doesn't see them. And there are a few people on this earth going like this. Will that be you? Is that going to be you? All your stuff is gone. All of what was here is gone. Is this, is this you? 
The Son of Man is coming. Take me. I've lived for this. This is all that has ever mattered since the day I became a Christian, and I want to be received. Now, again, you don't just sit around doing what you want to do, da, 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 and then he comes and you go, oh, 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 hey. You have been testifying about the glories of the Lord in your life. You have been enduring in your walk with God. And while others have been hiding, you have been separating yourself and standing out in the choices that are righteous and that are good. A couple of verses here, and and these are in your notes. We won't look at them today, but this language always makes us want to go to the second coming, and I think God did that on purpose. Let me explain what I mean. Go back to our text in verse 27. It's really hard to read Luke 21, 27 without thinking of the final judgment. The Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. But that's just language that God used every time God judged people or protected people or came to create a separation in people. If you go back to Daniel 7, and these are in your notes, in Daniel 7, this same earth shaking, sun, moon, stars coming of the Lord is used to depict the first days of the church. When Christ came and established his church, these are the saved and these are the lost. Joel in Acts 2, do you read Acts 2 today? Joel depicted it with darkness and blood and the skies, but it just meant God is coming to create a separation between those who are his and those who are not. This is talking about the destruction of Jerusalem and it didn't have flashes in the sky and there may not have even been earthquakes, but the point is he is coming and there's an inevitability of that and he will separate those who are lost from those who are saved. And in that way, do we have a choice? We have to allow our minds to go to this understanding that Jesus is coming. If it was right now, wouldn't that be awesome? Let's just do this right now. The only reason I would say no is there are souls that need to be saved. But if he came, don't you hope he comes on a Sunday morning at about, you know, 11, 15 central time? Where you're just gathered with God's people Or what about Sunday nights at 5.30? Some of you are like, no, don't don't choose that one. Stick with the Sunday morning. I like that better. I want to be with God's people, don't you? But you know, there's a probability that that's not going to happen. And not everybody's meeting in our time zone anyway. You're going to be out doing something somewhere. I don't know what you're going to be and what you're going to be doing. But there will be obvious attitude, direction, discipline, and expectations in his people that aren't going to be found in the people who are lost. Are you ready for that? Are you, will, you, will you lift up your head or will you say, give me two hours to fix some things? Last thought here. Back to our text in verses 29, Luke chapter 21. I'm in the right place. Let me read uh, 29 through 36. 29 through 36 and we'll wrap up a couple of thoughts. Then he told them a parable. Behold, the fig tree, Luke 21, 29. Behold, the fig tree and all the trees. As soon as they put forth leaves, you see it, and you know for yourselves that summer is now near. So you also, when you see these things happening, recognize that the kingdom of God is near. Truly I say to you, now this is a chilling line, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Be on guard so that your hearts will not be weighted down with dissipation and drunkenness and the worries of life. And that day will not come upon you suddenly like a trap. And didn't it for many, a million Jews it did. For it will come upon all those who dwell on the face of the earth, but keep on the alert at all times, praying that you may have strength to escape all these things and that, you're about to, that are about to take place and to stand before the Son of Man. Now, this verse is interesting to me because in most of my preaching history and life, it's been a verse that we use just to show that this is the destruction of Jerusalem and that it's not talking about the final coming. Have you seen that before? We go to verse 32 and we say, look, all that was going to happen during their generation. Well, stop acting like that's written for your benefit and understand that it was written to put a sense of intensity and urgency into the reader. Could you imagine being told about all these things? deterioration, destruction, separation, judgment of God upon this earth, and then Jesus looking you in the eye and saying, it will happen in your lifetime. You're going to see it. It's not one of those things that happens 100 years from now or 500 years from now or in some indefinite time period. It will happen in your life. So wake up. Wake up. You can't sleep through this. 
You can't put this on the next generation. Well, I see things are beginning to deteriorate a little bit. I bet my grandchildren are really going to have it tough. No, it's coming to you. So you need to be on guard, he's telling them. Don't go out there and live your life in the world, dissipation and drunkenness and riches and worries of life and thorns and thistles and choking out everything and somehow feel like it's going to be okay. It's not going to be okay. It's not going to be okay. To be lazy and passive and lax and integrated into the world and just be just like them. And then somehow there'll be some time later, he said, you're going to be out there living your life when this happens. I want you to think a minute about what your life might be like. Some of you and some of us, I hope it'd be the same. But what might your life be like if you genuinely believe with 100% certainty that Jesus is going to come back while you're still breathing oxygen? At any time and at any moment, two things ought to become very important for us. One, we need to get ready and stay ready. We can't let our hearts be weighted down. Are there Christians with weighted down hearts today? Do we have any weighted hearted Christians in the room today? Oh, life's so hard and health is fading and I'm worried about this. And that. what about our government? And, and what, what about, stop, stop it, pray have concerns, feel that pain, but give it to God. Because every time you're just caught in anxiety, that's the word I mean, in the anxiety, I know we're concerned about those things, but in anxiety for them, you're missing what's really going to happen. And it could be in our time. You say, how do I do that? That's like impossible. No, it's not. Verse 36, you need to be prayerful. We ought to be praying every day, alert at all times, praying that you have the strength to escape. When judgment comes, I want to escape it. I want to escape the devastation and the desolation. Pray that you'll be able to, to escape and to stand before the Son of Man. Now, that's an interesting phrase for me because when the Son of Man comes, I don't know if there'll be a floor, but my nose will be on it. I will be face down on the floor and able to look up. But then in a figurative way, what he's saying is there will be those going like this with their hearts and there will be those hiding and there will be those screaming and there will be those running. Which one of those are you going to be? That's the kind of decision that has to be made right here and right now. Because Jesus is coming again. Do you see it? You see it. This is about the destruction of Jerusalem, but it's a message that was timeless by design. There are four words that I thought about yesterday and I added them here. I think they'll come up. Let's see what happens. Matthew 25. I want you to go to Matthew 25 as we finish. Matthew 25 is going to drop the veil and take you straight to events that pertain to us. Matthew 25. Let me back up. Matthew 24 is about the destruction of Jerusalem, but it has this definite turn in Matthew 25 to things that would apply to them, but also to you. So we're going to finish with that in a moment. But there are four words that I thought about as I was just kind of recapping this and thinking, how would I put it into points? And I came up with these four words, signs, mission, urgency, and finality. If I was going to take everything that we read here and, and all that you have laid out here, which I double spell checked, I just pat on the back would be nice. I would sum it up in this way. There will be signs that this world is not dependable. There will be wars and rumors of wars. And I'm talking about destruction in Jerusalem right now. And you will see that things are falling apart. When you do, you need to be on mission. We know what the mission is. The mission is be evangelistic with your testimony. The mission is to stand strong. The mission is to stay on guard and not get too assimilated into the world. The mission is to back up, to get out and to create separations. Stay on mission because there's some real urgency to this. This generation will not pass away before this all happens. And when it does, there'll be no going back. Jerusalem will not be rebuilt. God will not give everybody a do-over. This will be the end for good. And for me, I'm completely comfortable taking all four of these words and moving them into this sermon today in February of 2022. You say, oh, is this going to get weird? Is this going to be like signs and end times? Is Chris an end timer? Um, yeah, sort of. There will be an end times and it will not look dissimilar to the times that we are in. Now you say, well, they could have said that about the Civil War and World War I and II and Vietnam and all the wars and all the troubles. You know, I kind of think that's the point. I kind of think that in every generation that has ever happened, the deterioration and the wars and the unreliability of the world has always, we're always in an end time phase. 
in terms of this world is cratering upon itself. And Christians, we're, we're in the heyday of Christian worldliness. You know what I mean? Where we can be like really worldly and people aren't mad at us. But that's cycling out and you need to be ready for it. And it's not true Christianity if we assimilate either way. But the point is, I think there's always been these signs. And, you know, I've told you before, the day Jesus, I believe the day Jesus comes back is the day that not one more soul will repent. When the Lord, 2 Peter 3, looks at the world and says, no one else will hear me, that's the day he will come back. You're going to try to tell me we're not as close to that as we've ever been. I'm going to call you a potential liar. The signs are always there. So it doesn't matter if you lived 100 years ago or today or the world's still here in 100 years. Stay on mission. What's the mission? Be separate. Testify. Preach. Share. Endure. Pray. Prepare. Because there is an urgency in every life. You say, I don't know about that. Ur- you're you're going to have a tough sell with me on that urgency thing. You know, he told them it was going to happen during their generation. There's no guarantee that it's going to happen during my generation. I've told you guys this before. 53 billion people have lived on this earth. 47 billion of them are dead. Everyone born before like 1905, unless you find some person in Asia somewhere and correct me later, is dead. The urgency of Christ's return and our own passing away means that in every life, in every room, in every place on this earth, there is the urgency to be right with God today. Because when we die or when he returns, the finality of that is so absolute, I can't even give you an illustration to try to show it to you. Like nothing's really like final, final here. I mean... It's over. You were with them or you were apart from them. You were on mission or you were involved in the missions of the world. What's it going to be? Matthew 25. Matthew 25. If you want more information, read Matthew 25. The parable of the five foolish virgins and the five prudent virgins. Virgins, we learn in verse 13 to be on the alert. You do not know the day the Lord is coming. You do not know the hour. And isn't that the interesting part? He telescoped the destruction of Jerusalem so that they could formulate a plan and make sure that they escape. He's not telescoping the final day. It will come at a day and an hour that no one knows. So what do we need to do? Then he tells the parable of the man with the talents. And he says, what you need to do, verse 16, is immediately gain. What you need to do is start right this second. How much time do I have left? I don't know, but it starts right now. Use this moment right now and immediately go about gaining all that you can. Verse 29, for to everyone who has production... Everyone who makes something for Christ out of their life, more will be given. And I believe in eternity more will be given, just like our our parable from last week. But the one who does not have produce, the one who is wasteful and assimilated in the world and worried by everything out there, even the little bit he has will be taken away. That's what happened to the Jews. (laughs) Even the little bit that they, I mean, they thought it was pretty awesome what they had. But it was just a little nothing. Even the little bit that they thought was so awesome was taken away. So it shall be, verse 30. When verse 31, the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them from one another as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Now, don't get me started. But he's telling us that there is a date before him that each person will face. And then he spent the rest of the chapter telling you who's going to be saved and who isn't. You remember? Those who are engaged in the mission of service. Those who are engaged in the purpose of benevolence, of kindness, and of spirituality will be saved. And those who were living for themselves will not. What's it going to be? This or some variation that already reveals what you know is going to happen even before he says the words. I want to know what's going to happen even before he says the words. How about you? But I don't want to be at me hiding under this table. I want to have my hands in the air, receiving his mercy because he told me he was coming and I believed him. Do you believe him? If you're not a child of God, if you're in the city, if you're like the world, 
If you're ready to be led by Jesus, He leads you to the water where He can forgive you by the power of His blood and He leads you to His people. A people who may be hated and despised, but a people who live for more. Are you living for more? If you need that, come forward now as we stand and sing.